Right. So next up, we have Blake Caldwell from Oak Ridge National Laboratory. Uh, Blake is an HPC systems administrator at Oak Ridge National Laboratory, where he has worked on Lustre as a file system for both HPC and general purpose cloud workloads. Meanwhile, he's also pursuing a PhD through the University of Colorado because he is a glutton for punishment, oh, sorry, and is doing development in the Linux kernel and distributed memory systems. He hopes to find where system level improvements can lead to efficiency in managing large scale systems. Dude, you're doing both at the same time. That's awesome. Solid respect. Um, I'm really looking forward to this talk, so I'm, I'm glad that you submitted uh, this abstract. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, Blake Caldwell from Oak Ridge. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, everyone. So, everyone doing well after uh, that pretty delicious lunch there? Doing pretty good myself. So I want to talk about running Docker on Luster. I don't want to just talk about running parts of what your Docker workload uses, parts of that data on Luster, but actually the whole thing on Luster. So this is kind of ironic that uh, the, Docker, the Docker community really champions the idea of stateless application architecture, but Docker itself is very stateful in the way it manages artifacts. So this is, um, this is something that you want to tackle with instead using a distributed file store to manage those artifacts. So let's start off. Um, and just to give a quick introduction about what is Docker, um, most of us know what Docker is, and who doesn't. So, but you know, just quickly, it's very simply just a system for packaging, shipping, and running containers. An important distinction is that it's just the user environment. It's not the kernel or the associated application or uh, device drivers, just the user environments. So this means it's useful for things that like consistent user environments. So being able to move that user environment from one system to another, package it up cleanly, um, describe all your uh, dependencies, and um, also, furthermore, the isolation benefits. So as far as consistent user environments, um, the typical use case is that it's used, used for, um, for development use cases. So uh, you know, rapid, um, you know, rapid redeployment, um, also, you know, integrating into continuous integration pipelines and such. Um, additionally, since it's also creating these, um, you know, well-defined and reproducible user environments, it can also be used for reproducible research. So, for an experiment where you can capture all of your, uh, both your the code to run your experiment, um, link in your data, and all the procedures that you ran through for the experiment, you can also you can hand off to someone else and they can reproduce your results. So, furthermore, application isolation um, within you know, C groups uh, and namespaces, containers isolate themselves from each other. So this leads into the use case of server consolidation, where if you can provide the abstraction that that container is the only thing on the system, well, you might as well take advantage of that and put more containers on the same system um, and achieve higher density there. So I want to start off with a little a conversation here um, it's kind of a, you know, very fictional, but imagine there are two people here. There's an HPC user, um, much like some of us in the audience, um, or other people we know, and, you know, they have, a, they have a weather modeling application that they, they packaged up. It took them a week to package up, and now they want to run it on a cluster. So they say, well, hey, how do I run the same image on 50 different nodes? Sounds pretty simple. And so the other, other character here is the Docker Oracle, who knows everything about the Docker world. He's familiar with uh, using Docker in development, and think you know there's an answer for this. He says, just push it to Docker Hub. Well, okay, that might work, but the HPC user didn't mention that there's some code in his application that he doesn't want to ship off the network. He wants to keep that on site. So what do you do? So what do you do then if you can't if you can't leave the local network? Simple, create a, pri a private repository. All right, so you go off and do this, um, launch some, app some containers, um, go through a few iteration cycles, and suddenly, wait, you get a, you're out of space on the Docker registry, and then you try deleting images, you're still out of space. The delete function within the Docker registry has not been implemented. So the Docker registry will continue to grow and grow and grow. So the solution in that case is just to, to remove it and start over. It's not very useful as far as um, managing like long-term operations. So 
moving on to the next issue, if you have one, one registry and a lot of compute nodes, this is a bottleneck. 50 nodes, maybe it works with just one registry. But what if you do 100 or 1,000? So how do you fix that? Well, the, the Docker Oracle would say, just load balance the registries. So now you have an infrastructure that you're building out for Docker itself, beyond, beyond your application infrastructure. Um, you, you, know, you have now your registries, an HTTP load balancer. So it would work, but you have this duplication of data that moves from the registry, and you know, in times that data needs to move across the network. How can we improve upon that here? Finally, images become inconsistent. As a user um, on a compute node makes some changes, pushes that to the Docker registry, pulls it from another node, and then a third node, you know, or maybe the 50th node, doesn't get that image pulled. Now you have different images across the cluster. So the, you know, the, the, uh, the Docker Oracle will say, well, of course, this is just you know, redeploy. You should treat your nodes as if they were cattle, not pets, and goes on and on. So we've heard this before. It's not a satisfactory answer to how to run an HPC application or how Docker can help HPC applications. So before diving into some possible, um, or some, an exploration of possible, possible solutions, um, looking at a normal Docker pull, just to uh, some background here. So the user would log into a system with Docker running, with a Docker daemon there, and they'd issue a pull request for a particular image um, through the Docker command line interface. That would be an HTTP request to the registry. The registry would send that data back over the HTTP. And then on the node, it becomes unpacked. So the, re the, uh, the image might be three layers here. And those are actually just tar GZs. Um, they are just, it's just a file system uh, tarred up. It's going to be um, pulled over to the, the Docker node and uncompressed. And so some will be different sizes, some will be greater there. You know, I mean, the base image is the largest. Then we have a layer where we add some dependencies, like you run a yum update, and then maybe the code itself on the top layer. And so um, we'll talk more about this later, but Docker implements the copy on, copy on write um, semantics for all of its image store, or all of its uh, local container images. Uh, so that, you know, reducing, so the top, viewing from the top layer, it has visibility of all the other layers below it. Now back to the HPC case. So what if we want to do this for multiple nodes? Well, it's a pretty simple diagram. You just pull that image to four different nodes. And then those containers on the nodes, on each node, can share the same image. But that image has been replicated four times. This is what I was talking about. It's going to be replicated 50 times, 100 times, 1,000 times. The problem isn't, on the local side, it's that data moving across the network and also the inconsistency that comes from it. So we're talking about Lustre. Why, why is Lustre important for this? It's present in most computing, cluster computing environments already. We already use it um, for shared storage. So if it's there, if it fits the need to shared persistent file system, let's leverage it. Furthermore, why don't we, well, the question, why don't we use NFS? That might be the first choice. But the problem we're trying to solve is speeding up the, um, the par or running multiple containers um, on different nodes in parallel. So leverage Docker's par um, you know, native um, parallel you know, concurrent, um, concurrent request handling uh, uh, you know, capabilities there. So then why, why, does Docker, or why does Docker need a distributed image store? Why is it helpful? So it's actually some, it's a sore spot with Docker, something that Docker really needs. Docker means, or deployment rather, means you're waiting a lot of I.O. So you'll pull an image and you see the, the images you know, come across the poles, but you spend most of the time waiting for it to extract that image from its tarred up file onto disk. So yes, Docker, containers are very fast. They run, your application runs on bare metal, but most of that time you spend during that you know, supposedly fast iteration cycle, you spend waiting on disk I.O. It's very wasteful. Because copies are everywhere. You have the, those copies on each, well, it's creating a new copy on each system. Uh, I mentioned things, consistency issue. Furthermore, security. If you have all your images stored on a central um, image store, and there's a new vulnerability that comes out that affects one of those layers, you just have one layer to fix. And then every new container that you start afterwards will have, um, we'll have the correct patch. So the final piece of background here, um, images versus volume, just an important distinction here. Images, the base, 
the base file system of the container, is it, or if you will, the true environment. So these are stored in the Docker registries, accessed via push or pull mechanism, um, and they make up layers. Or they're made up of layers in a copy on write fashion. Volumes, on the other hand, these are file system mounts that are added after the container starts. So this is how you would take data um, from an external store and pull it in. So your large data sets you would pull in through volumes. They could either be bind mounts on the host, or there are plugins available for other distributed file stores. So if you have a, um, you want to use Ceph for this or Gluster, th those, those plugins exist. There's not one for Luster yet, but it'd be a relatively straightforward path to implement one of those. However, what I'm concerned about here is running Docker images on Luster. So let's look at some of the options here. And the first obvious one would be just using what's built in Docker. So the device mapper interface, or device mapper and using loopback devices, that is the default, or the fallback inter, um, implementation for Docker. I just done that way because device mapper exists um, in all, on all major di distributions, um, has kernel support um, since uh, many, many versions ago, and doesn't require any external block device configuration. You just give it a file system, it creates its own block devices on top of it, and then starts running containers. And uh, thin provision snapshots built into the device mapper framework also support copy and write. But one of the problems here, well actually this is actually a benefit. So metadata operations are performed locally within the VFS layer. So that image is read in, and then it, those director entries are cached locally. So opening a file, it doesn't actually contact, the, say, a, a Luster um, metadata server to open that up. So if you're trying to limit metadata operations, that would be a benefit. However, it's quite slow. Um, this has been cited many places um, with Docker and, or in the Docker context compared to the other options that are available. Um, you know, there's m several aspects to that. One, that you're reading off the block device, so you're layering abstractions, but you're also not able to share page cache entries with a device mapper. So every container that starts up, it's going, for all the, the D entries, it's going to create a new page cache entry um, for each of them. So if you have a one gigabyte container, you might end up pulling or using four or five gigabytes memory if you're going to start four or five different containers. So let's move on to another option. This is still just native uh, um, Docker options, what Docker already provides. We could use OverlayFS. So it's been upstream in the Linux kernel since 3.18. Uh, it, it furthermore, well, so this note about it hasn't always been supported on distributed file systems. Before, it still doesn't work cleanly with NFS. Um, so the idea that you could have NFS read-only layer and then overlay FS on top of that. It doesn't work as of 4.4. Um, I think there are patches going to 4.5 that will make that work better. However, for Luster, that wasn't the case. Um, actually, so I, I tried this. This was one of, the, one of the first options. Well, this seems like a great way of doing it. But there are some, there's some flags in um, some of the Luster, uh, so, some decache flags within Luster that are preventing this from working natively with, um, with Docker, or rather with OverlayFS, how it is now. So this wasn't an option, um, but it's very promising because OverlayFS provides a union mount where we have these read-only layers and then a read-write layer. So those read-only layers, this would attack the problem of achieving consistency throughout, uh, among the different uh, images across different nodes, possibly. Um, and you know, another detail is like, so it achieves copy and writes by when there's a modification, it copies up that file to a higher layer, and then this is the, the read-write layer, and then it can modify that layer, um, where the container it's, will see all the different images, and if there's, so here's a diagram of, um, taken from the Docker um, website of how this works. So the, the topmost layer, it has, um, so all four files are visible. Files one and three exist in the lowest level. They haven't been modified. So reads from those to those inodes from file one or file two go down to the lowest level. Um, so you know, it's very efficient. For the, for the files that have been modified, for file two, uh, that instead gets read from the modified layer. File four doesn't exist in the lower level gets read from the modified layer. Some of the cons, um, 
or rather start with the pros. Page cache entries are shared across all containers. So it's just a file system uh, to the Linux kernel. When you read from an overlayfs merge directory, that top layer, it's just it's the same, same namespace. So if it's just like a regular file system that if multiple containers read that, they'll share the same uh, page, ent page cache entries. Uh, natively supports copy and write, but there's a, there's a penalty with the copy, on, the copy up um, operation. The worst part, though, is Docker's implementation of using OverlayFS. So Docker puts, well, to deal with the issue where OverlayFS only supported one read-only layer originally, you could have that read-write read layer on top, but the read-only layer, it only supported one of those originally. And so when Docker first um, included the uh, OverlayFS driver, it had to deal with that. The way it deal, did with, deal with that is that when you would pull an image from the re image registry, you'd pull it over, um, unpack of each of those onto disk, but you don't know at what point you're gonna start the container. You can start the container at the on top of the lowest image or on top of the highest one. So all the way up through the stack, it created the abstraction of a full file system for each of those through, by using hard links. So the, is the hard links all the way down for each of those images. So the number of, number of files um, is just basically astronomical. You'll typically run out of inodes um, running this. So it's you know, not suitable for an existing Lustre file system. Furthermore, this, all these files, they exist on the regular file system. All these will involve metadata lookups. So this is not something you want to do if you're concerned about metadata performance. So with all that said, what's a, what's a hybrid tech, um, approach we could take? Well, we could take a loopback device and overlay FS. How would this work? Well, we have the luster mount there at the bottom. We unpacked our image. We already pulled, um, pulled all of them there, and you know, they're, um, rather, sorry, pushed those to the Im to image repository. And then on the Docker host, we now implemented a new graph driver. So that's, um, that's Docker terminology for how images are read, so it's the copy and write mechanism. But there's the merge directory, so this is the overlayFS construct, where overlayFS maps the three lower le levels and the upper directory onto that merge directory. So what I'm proposing here is the three lower directories could be ext4 ex, or XFS uh, uh, loopback devices. But these are just images on the lesser file system. Then, so you mount all those. There's no copying to make those accessible. All those are mounted and accessible. And to make your copy and write abstraction, now use overlayFS between these different directories. So with that in mind, um, you know, making progress down, down that aspect, it seems to be the only way, uh, or well, the best way to get it to work. So the, um, I did try the, uh, the overlayFS mechanism, and there's promise that that will work in future releases. Um, it didn't work as of Linux 4.4. Uh, James mentioned earlier that Linux 4.2 is supported, so we're you know, getting very close to some of those updates and perhaps some of the um, you know, changes in you know, 4.5 would work because OverlayFS is trying to support uh, running on NFS, so they are making um, inroads into using a you know, network file system for a read-only lower level. So here's a link to uh, where, where I'm working on the implementation, where it'll be posted. Um, once it's approved through, um, you know, I can um, open source it, it'll be posted here. There's not much on this, there's nothing on this link right now, um, but on here I'll also include uh, the, the procedures for creating the environments. And so just like Docker's about creating reproducible environments, um, I've been doing all the, the infrastructure setup using uh, Jupyter Notebooks. So this is an IPython notebook. And there's a feature that you can actually run a bash kernel. So this, might, this would be a way that you could you know, recreate this environment um, locally. So you know, with that in mind, some of the conclusions here. So loopback devices on Luster could support cluster competing workloads. They're not, you know, it's, it's not there yet. There's some still drawbacks, or the, definitely drawbacks. Um, but this would, be, this would be a case where you have no image pulls. You just run your Docker container. You start up a node is purely stateless. You start it up, it doesn't even, even know anything other than the luster mount and the path where, um, where the Docker images are stored. And the images have already been you know, pulled there by another node or perhaps by an administrator. Uh, 
read-only layers on the file system, that's an important aspect that if you control how images get put on the file system, then you control the consistency, the security aspect. But the downside is that here we're looking at a block device. We were talking about uh, using loopback block devices. Uh, and now you would have multiple systems mounting those, loop, those block devices. So there needs to be a read-only, um, um, or um, Docker needs to enforce some read-only um, operations there so, so that you know, if you do mount that, the, the Docker graph driver itself will not write to any of those lower levels. The solution I mentioned above with uh, temp, or before on the earlier slide was with tempfs as an upper layer. That's where you would have, this would be a purely ephemeral. So none of your, you wouldn't be storing any state there that if you want to actually, if the user actually wants to write state, they should write that on a volume. That's what Docker volumes are meant for. Uh, this, uh, this tempfs, that would be for something like files in slash etsy or slash var that are needed for run store process IDs or just local state information. Uh, now the work that remains, uh, the Docker, the upstream um, overlayfs driver currently only, only uses uh, one, uh, one read-only layer. There's been some attempts to support multiple read-only layers, but there's, that's, that only is going to have, um, the promise of that's limited. So, the number of layers that you can write, right, or that you can mount right now within Docker is limited to one page worth, um, and someone found that out to be about 38 different layers. So, you know, that, that'd be a maximum. You are allowed to stack OverlayFS layers, so you could have 38 layers in OverlayFS overlay mount, and then mount another um, OverlayFS mount on top of that, but you can only do that twice. That's a um, hard-coded limitation in, in the kernel currently. Furthermore, there's uh, LU 6585 uh, for the LL loop driver. So that's a, the work there was done earlier. Um, I don't believe it's, uh, it, you know, it's been updated in a long time, but the, the ticket is about updating support for that driver and bringing it um, you know, into use in you know, Luster in a current version. So that's an area where there could be several more enhancements where um, you know, we could improve the performance to the block device itself that, you know, that could, also, that could be a limitation. Um, and so I want to make a comment there that uh, Robert Reed m made a comment on there, on this ticket, how Docker could be used for, or how, this could, how that could be used for the Docker use case. So, I mean, I think that that's the, you know, people are, have seen that. This is the, that's the place to continue this work. Um, with that, I just want to conclude with some resources, uh, some, you know, very good uh, deep dives into Docker storage drivers. Um, and then some links on to um, recreating the reproducible environment, so for actually testing this out and running uh, Docker or on OverlayFS. So with that, I would like to open up for questions. Docker fans, mavens? Yes, no? All right. Blake, thank you very much.